Canada's initial response to youth crime recognized that children and adolescents were different from adults, but did not actually separate the criminal justice system as a youth system and adult system. It was all dealt with under the same umbrella. So that's the, the situation in Canada in the 19th, early 20th century, but let's just sort of pull back for a second and get an understanding of how youth justice has worked over time. So pre-enlightenment, so think medieval era and onwards, children were treated as miniature adults. So there was no need to even begin to think about a separate justice system or responding to children differently from adults. As we see maybe towards the enlightenment, especially when we begin to see the spreading of new ideas, we begin to see this idea of patria posteritas which means that the father had absolute control over the child. So this was a transition from the focus on the church having control to the more patriarchal social structures that we've seen for the last couple hundred years, where children were the possessions of the father. The family unit was the possession of the father. So there was no need for a separate youth justice system or anything like that because the father was responsible but was beginning to recognize that given the father is responsible for this person, maybe it does mean that we're thinking about youth differently, that the individual is being raised, mentored, trained by the father because they are distinctly different from adults in terms of their development. We then begin to see the principle of parens patriae, which is this idea that when the father is not able to take responsibility of the child, the king or the state will assume responsibility for this individual. All the people living within a country or a particular region or particular state represent the responsibility of the person ruling over that region. So what this means is the courts would take responsibility of the child if parents died or if parents were deemed unfit to raise this child. So still there was no distinct youth justice system, but there was a recognition that courts were required or mandated under this principle of parens patriae to begin to look out for children, to try and identify what is in the best interests of the child, and then enact specific legislation or specific laws that will look over the child. So now we need to go back to Canada and look at Canada's perspective on crime. What were the causes of crime according to Canada during agrarian societies? The main one was the fur trade, and then tangentially related to the fur trade was the consumption of alcohol. That, so the fur trade kind of had two main consequences that linked to criminal behavior. One was that kids were taking on these adult roles and engaging in adult behaviors like drinking, and that this was leading to their criminal behavior. The other was that now, during the fur trade, these kids have too much freedom. They're off on their own. No longer do we see that apprenticeship, mentorship relationship. When Canada shifted to an industrial society, the main causes of youth crime were viewed to be poverty, homelessness, and the lack of family. But Keep in mind, these weren't used as the explanations for why kids were involved in crime. It was more like kids were involved in crime because they were immoral as a result of poverty, homelessness, and the lack of family. So the cause of crime is this immorality. They were recognizing that if we improve their poverty, improve their homelessness, improve their lack of family, maybe that will teach them a sense of morals. The Industrial Revolution was so important because it created youth crime, but it also created exposure to youth crime. So we saw substantial increases in youth crime during the Industrial Revolution in Canada and also the United States, where we see upticks in property offenses, especially as a result of needing to steal food, steal items to basically live. Sometimes we saw increases in violent crime as we saw ethnic-centric gangs uh, become more common. So with influxes in immigration, we didn't see necessarily this melting pot where everybody lived in the same areas, went to the same churches and so on. Instead, we saw that there were Irish-based gangs or Polish-based gangs or Italian-based gangs, and they would settle in specific neighborhoods. 
So we saw this especially in the United States where there's these ethnocentric neighborhoods as well. And this is what led to the creation of ethnocentric gangs. So what was Canada's response to youth crime? Basically during the 1800s, Canadian Parliament passed laws to say that children under the age of seven were considered doly incapax, meaning that they were incapable of crime, almost like saying that they were not criminally responsible for their behavior. Children between ages seven to 13 were considered prima facie, so presumptively presumed incapable of crime. But this presumption could be rebutted by Crown Council in special circumstances. So if the 12 year old seemed like they were clearly responsible for criminal behavior, then it was up to the prosecution to show that that was the case. Children from ages 14 onwards were considered fully responsible for their crimes and all children were dealt with through the adult justice system. So they didn't even call it an adult justice system at the time, it was just the justice system. There was no separation of youth and adults. Although there wasn't a separate justice system, people began to think about youth crime as different from adult crime and began to think that responses to youth crime needed to be different. During Canada's Industrial Revolution, the response to youth crime was about removing them from their social environment or from the community that they were a part of. So removing kids from the community meant creating these houses of refuge, where we had Quakers, and where the term Quaker comes from is literally the idea about the religion that people close to God would begin to shake or quake, and that's why they were called Quakers marked a shift in the emphasis from family-centered discipline to if the family isn't there, we're going to adopt that parens patriae principle. And it's now the young person is under the control or the purview of the state. The idea here was that adults were corrupting youth and we need to keep them separate from adults and focus on hard work and discipline. Most juvenile institutions took on the characteristics of adult prisons, however. So there was this goal of separating youth from adults and that kind of work, but the youth system and the adult system were quite similar in terms of horrific conditions and abuse. These institutions were characterized by underfunding, high rates of escape, chronic mismanagement, and a general lack of progress in the sense that they didn't actually seem to be helping youth whatsoever. From houses of refuge came reformatories in the mid 19th century, where the goal was to try and teach youth basic skills like how to read and write that would allow them to enter the job market upon their release. What some believed was happening though was that these reformatories became schools of crime, where it was an opportunity for orphaned youth to meet other like-minded youth who would then, once released into the community, form a gang and continue to commit crime together. These reform schools often weren't targeting individuals because of their criminal or delinquent behavior, but actually because of their poverty. So it was really a good example of poverty being criminalized. And this was very much a religious divide that I alluded to at the beginning of lecture, where it was Catholic immigrants versus Protestant institutions where Protestant institutions were targeting Catholic children to make these children more like our children. So the goal was cultural reform or religious reform and not just behavioral reform. So the new immigrants most vulnerable to poverty were the ones who were also most vulnerable to institutionalization. 